right, hopefully this is on. There we go. So this is Kurt. Um, <laughs> it's short for Kurt Monty, which is uh, means owner of the nose. Yeah, I don't know why they gave it that name, but uh, it's from Israel. Uh, it's an Israeli red fig, and um, it's got at least 13 figs on it. This guy here almost got eaten the other day, but I wanted you to see a ripe one. Um, but 13 figs on it. Now, most of the of the fig masters, if you will, uh, will tell you to pluck those figs off and let the tree grow. Um, but I don't know about you, but I want fruit, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I left them on there. Um, and it was made to produce fruit, wasn't it? That's its purpose. Just like this fig tree, um, God wants fruit from us, right? And he put us on this earth, he put us on, in this place to bear fruit. And we see this in uh, scripture here, uh, Luke 13. If you've got your Bibles, open it up. If not, I'm going to have it up on the screen. So what's that look like um, to bear fruit? What's God wanting? Why aren't we bearing it? So uh, read with me here, and um, we're going to look into it. Luke 13, 6 through 9. He, Jesus, also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he, the keeper, answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and I fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Pray with me, would you? Lord, I, I thank you for this word, um, this parable. Lord, there's so much here. Father, I just pray now that um, you open our eyes to, to the truth here, Lord. Father, you help us to, to get out of this. Lord, what you want us to get out of this. Take me out of this and, and just put you in it. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We invite you here. We need you here. So come and, and fill this place. Open our eyes. Open our ears so that we hear what you have to say to the church. And as always, Lord, I pray right now not to give a good message, Lord, but a message that does some good. For Hillside, Lord, for your people, for your city, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get to work. Um, so as with any parable, um, each major player in it right, has a role and, and represents something. And in this one in particular, uh, we have the owner of the vineyard, and that's God, right? Uh, we have the keeper of the vineyard, that's Jesus. The church is the vineyard, and you are the fig tree. But what's interesting here is that, that someone would plant a fig tree in, in a vineyard, See, fig trees will grow anywhere. They literally will. Um, they grow in the wild in Israel, all over the place. They grow fast. It's not uncommon for one to grow uh, six feet in a year. Um, but the owner had this fig tree planted in his vineyard, in the most fertile spot, the most valued spot that he possibly could put it at, he put this tree at. It kind of tells us something about, um, about the kingdom. It tells us that we're not here to take up space, right? God has us here for a purpose. God has you here for a purpose. Um, and we also see something else that if we don't bear that fruit, um, we'll get cut down. And, and make no mistake here, he's talking about who gets in and who gets out uh, into the kingdom, into heaven. Um, it makes God sound a little bit harsh, but it's not really because we also see the intercessor. We see Jesus here stepping forward and say, sir, let it alone. Let me see what I can do. And it's why it's so easy to see Jesus as the intercessor here, because he intercedes for, for a sinful man at Calvary. He intercedes for us when we pray in his name. And on the last day, he will intercede and say, Father, this one belongs to me. Jesus has a personal interest in you. A personal interest. You were planted here, not by mistake, but on purpose. You were put here on purpose, and you have a purpose. Sometimes in our vast uh, conception of God or perception of God, man, we can see him as so big and powerful that we lose track of this. 
that he has a personal interest in you. And, and because we're so important to him, because he loves us so much, um, this act of bearing fruit, it's a two-way street. Yeah, it brings the Lord glory. But it also fulfills your purpose. It makes you matter. And he wants to see that for us because he wants us to do something. We can't just sit here. We can't just warm a pew. You know, when, when my dad retired from the Air Force, um, we had, there were seven kids. And uh, he was a sergeant, so like, wouldn't like big officer money, if that even exists. I don't know how much they make. But when he retired, he, uh, he went to work for a company in the same building on the base called Gould. And they did flight simulator stuff. And um, his job there was to wait for the flight simulator to break down and then fix it. And it was glorious, all right, because he walked out making like 10 bucks an hour. This is 1980. It wasn't bad money, I guess. And there's, you know, Army benefit or Air Force benefits. But he walked back in making almost three times that much. Seven kids, though, you know, it didn't, still didn't go that far. But it was great because I, I finally got clothes that didn't belong to my brothers or, sadly, my sisters first. Um, you know, they were, they were like my clothes. <laughs> you know, man, that's a big thing, right? And then after about six months working there, he quit. And I remember a, a friend of his over, uh, Mr. Smith, Tom, and he said, Bill, man, why did you leave that great job? I don't understand. Why did you leave? He said, because I didn't do anything there. I just sat around taking up space. I've got to do something. Look, if you want to be fulfilled in, in this Christian life, in, in your faith walk, you've got to do something. You've got to be involved with something. You've got to be a blessing. Man, if you're stagnating in your spiritual walk, if you've just taken up space, check for fruit. Who are you being a blessing to? Because, look, this was, this was um, initially spoken to the, the Israelites. And um, they were told all the way back in Genesis 12, Abraham was told this, that, that through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You are blessed to be a blessing. Who are you blessing? Right, where are you serving at? Are you bearing fruit? If you're unhappy, if you're feeling unfulfilled, man, start. It can start today. But don't be discouraged if you don't see any right now. It's not the end of the world because we also see in this parable that the keeper, Jesus, wasn't concerned with the lack of fruit in the past. He wasn't even concerned with the current lack of fruit. He says, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. See, he wasn't concerned with, um, with what did or didn't happen in the past. All right? N not at all. He was concerned with what he could do to make it bear fruit. Right? The past didn't matter. Let me say that again. The past doesn't matter. Church, your past doesn't matter. Man, hear that and know that. It just doesn't. Um, Why well, does it matter to people? There's the other, other part of that. You know, when um, Kat and I were looking to adopt, you have to put references uh, in your adoption application and stuff, and, and they, they check them all. And one of the people we put on there was Lindsay. Sorry, Lindsay, I don't mean to out you here. But when they called her, she said, um, oh, yeah, oh, I just love Pastor Bill. Yeah, you know, he overcame addiction, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's what? He overcame what? Well, addiction. Yeah, he, he was an addict. Oh, well, guess who I got to call from? <laughs> <laughs> so DHS calls me and said, well, we talked to some of your references, and uh, they tell us you're an addict. And I was like, well, no, I was an addict. Um, but I'm not anymore. They said, well, well, why didn't you share this? You know, during the interviews and, and on the paper and everything, I said, for the simple fact that that God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. God takes our sin and puts it in the sea of the forgetfulness. It's on the bottom of the ocean. God does this. People don't. And he says, I see your point. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we adopted a beautiful little girl that we love like our own. <laughs> um. This isn't how it is with God. Look, God wasn't concerned with, um, he wasn't concerned with Moses' past. He was a murderer, right? He was a hermit in the desert when God called him out. 
He wasn't concerned with his past. He took him out, and, and he made him the leader of a nation. He wasn't concerned with Jeremiah's past. He didn't have one. He was a boy from a fallen nation, but he took him out, and he made him a prophet. He wasn't concerned about Saul's past. No, he found Saul. He changed his name to Paul, and he used him to start a revolution. Look, God doesn't care about your past. He wants to invest in your future. That's what we see from this fig tree. Man, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. You are brand new. And, and, and Paul backs this up by saying, Behold, all things have become new. All things. And as often as we fail, as often as we slip, his mercies are new every single day. This is some of the fruit that he's looking for. In fact, early in this, in this chapter, he says it twice. Repent, change your course, or you will likewise perish. Talks about the, the tower at Siloam that fell on some people, the, the Galileans who, who got killed by, by Pilate. Change, change your course, or you likewise will perish. But we can't forget this either, that, that our past doesn't matter. It's what we do now. It's what we do in our future that does. Because the enemy wants to keep us snagged up in that past. He'd like to keep us mired down in our own shame, in our own guilt, in our own hurt. But Jesus wants to set us free. Look, we deny ourselves more spiritual blessings by worrying about that past. But look, know this. God uses broken vessels. Yes, he does. He uses an addict to, to be your pastor. That's something right there. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that God uses the foolish things of this earth to confound the wise, the things that are nothing, to be everything. Maybe you're not sharing your faith at, at work. Maybe you're not living this out in front of your own social circle because, hey, they knew you before. Or maybe they saw you in some very unchristian-like acts. It starts today. It can start tomorrow. Change starts with you, and it moves outward. It always does. Look, I'd been saved for, for a couple months, I guess, and we were, um, we were framing up a, the second floor of a, of a garage. And uh, it was kind of icy out, uh, a little bit frost on everything, and, and I was pinning a wall together. My, my nail gun head slipped, and the nail bounced off the top of the board into my hand and out the side here. And, <laughs> And I said, oh, you dirty dog. And uh, everybody stopped to look. Like, Get back to work. Then I went down, and a little bit of uh, paper towels and duct tape, man, good as gold. <laughs> went back up there, and, and we finished out the day. And, and when we packed up and got ready to leave and got in the truck, one of the guys that worked for me said, so, so this is real. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, this Christian thing is real. Well, of course it's real. What are you talking about? He said, because I've seen you shoot yourself with a nail gun before, sadly. <laughs> it wasn't a habit. I didn't get to celebrate recovery for it. I, sh I struggled with shooting myself with a nail gun. No, it wasn't anything like that. It's just when you get in a hurry, it happens sometimes. And the things that came out of your mouth uh, would make sailors cry. But you said, you dirty dog. Get back to work. It wasn't particularly kind, but it was a big change. Look, it takes time, but it starts with you. And it can start today. It can start tomorrow. Put Jesus in there. Or maybe you're the one saying, Preacher, I'm just too far gone. Um, it's, uh, I'm just lucky the roof don't fall in on this place when I come in here. Nobody wants me. I've done so much in the past. I can't be a blessing to other people. And I'm preaching to somebody here right now. Friend, you severely underestimate the grace and love of our Savior. You severely underestimate him. Because it's there. Let him shake up your roots. Let him, let him neutrify you. I'm going to make that word up. Or maybe your heart's hardened, right? And it's not your doing. 
He said, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. Man, I, I had to wonder what that meant. Why has it got to dig around it? Right? This is the most fertile ground. That it, it's a vineyard, man. It, what's with digging around it? Um, isn't it already fertile? Isn't it already, like, good soil? Well, yeah, but, but this is a fig tree. Um, and they were good for more than just figs. See, fig trees evaporate huge amounts of water from their leaves. Huge amounts of water uh, from their leaves. And um, so much so that it cools the air beneath it by, by several degrees. And so an ancient Middle Eastern blessing would be, may you sit under the shade of your own fig tree. Um, this actually comes from Micah 4.4. 4. Rabbis taught underneath fig trees. When Jesus first saw Nathaniel, where was he at? Underneath the fig tree. It was a place where people congregated. So perhaps then the digging up was because the ground was trampled and the tree could neither receive nutrient and probably not water. The keeper dug up around it because the ground was packed down. The ground had been trampled. You know who one of the hardest people to reach for the gospel is? Somebody who's been to church and has been trampled by other people. It was a problem in the early church. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians and the Colossians. He said, bear with one another and forgive one another. But he was just following the words of Jesus when, when Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Um, I say seven times because I'm so freaking holy, right? <laughs> Jesus said, no, no, no. It's seven times 70, an immeasurable amount of time. Man, that shook the roots uh, of, of everything they had thought and everything they had learned up to that point. Forgiveness. It keeps us from bearing fruit. If you've got a grudge in your life, man, you're not going to bear fruit. If you're harboring unforgiveness, man, you're not going to bear fruit. Let Jesus cultivate your heart. Let him shake it up. And maybe that's not even it. And I get it. See, fig trees have a thick and shallow root base. And on the top of this root base are big, thick roots. And they'll absorb water, but they won't absorb nutrients. That stuff's underneath. And it needs air to help it. And so um, every spring before I do my main fertilizing on my trees, and I've got way too many, um, I've got to get a pry bar in there and pry up around, dig up the roots, shake them up, loosen them up, and then the fertilizer goes in, and then the water goes on it. Otherwise, it gets pot-bound. Oh, yeah, it'll suck up some water, um, a little bit enough to, to stay looking beautiful, but it won't take in the nutrients. They run to the side, down, and then out the bottom. And a lot of times, people are, are like fig trees. And this is why, why Jesus used this example. We don't get it because here in Iowa, we don't know much about fig trees. Although we have some here at the church. And they will bear fruit this year, I believe. Um, but they'll look beautiful if the roots aren't taken up and shooken up. But they won't bear fruit. We're like that because we get in this place and um, we do most of our growing in the first three years, just like a fig tree does. And I've got fig trees that are four years old and I'm still waiting and they haven't done it yet. Um, I keep them around because they're beautiful. God, not so much. He wants fruit. He wants us to bear fruit. Jesus shook up the ground when he said that he was going to go to the cross. He's going to die for us. His body broken and his blood shed. This was designed 
to shake up the roots of Israel. They still refused fruit, so it came to us. So we handed out our our juice and uh, and our wafers. If you don't have one, uh, throw your hand up and Jess will get you one. So what are the nutrients then? Well, in John 6.55, Jesus said this, My body is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. These are the things that, that feed us. His death and his resurrection, the sacrifice that he made for, for us, should spur us on to do good works. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians that, that if you take this without examining yourself, without examining the blessing that you're being to others, that you take it in vain. May that never be said of us. So, taking the wafer. Jesus said this, this is my body, which was broken for you. Let us take. And then the wine. He said, this is my blood which was shed for you. This is what the Lord did for us. He didn't do it in vain. And we shouldn't take it in vain. As the band begins to play their last song, we're going to open up the altars. Examine yourself. Who are you being a blessing to? If no one comes to mind, nothing comes to mind. Choose this moment right now today. Come up and do some business with the Lord. And say, Lord, cultivate me. Point me in the right direction. We're here for a purpose, and that's to bear fruit. Thanks.